Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one and welcome back to World of Warships where today in this tier 10 arms race battle on the hotspot map Maltese Knight is going to be taking the tier 10 US Navy Steel Light Destroyer out for a spin. As you can probably tell by his name, Maltese Knight who streams World of Warships on Twitch, Maltese Knight hails from the Mediterranean island of Malta. The entire island that was awarded the George Cross the British Empire's highest civilian award for gallantry for their fortitude in standing up to siege at the hands of the Germans and the Italians during World War II and a bastion of the Royal Navy for centuries, although sadly not anymore. Malta also holds the distinction of being the place where the actor Oliver Reed died in the middle of a legendary drinking binge with a bunch of Royal Navy sailors who were in Malta at the time while he was filming the movie Gladiator. But enough about Malta onto Maltese Knight, or more specifically the ship that he's sailing, the Tier 10 light cruiser, the USS Austin. So this is a ship that was made available for sale in the armory for steel slightly more than a year ago. It's, it's a difficult ship to describe. It's not a bad ship, although it does tend to polarise the people who use it. It's probably best to compare it to the Atlanta, because like the Atlanta, the Austin, is an extremely light cruiser armed with 127mm destroyer caliber guns. It has a lot of them, but it doesn't have as many as the Atlanta. The Atlanta has wing turrets on either side of the bridge, which means the Austin's broadside is two guns less. The guns on the Austin also have a fairly slow reload at around eight seconds. But this is made up for by the Austin's gimmick, and we'll talk about that in a moment. For now, let's continue to draw some comparisons with the Atlanta, which I should remind you is a Tier 7, not a Tier 10, light cruiser. And yet, while the Atlanta is not known for having a large hit point pool, it only has 3,200 hit points less than the Austin. The Austin, unless you take the survivability expert skill, which Maltese Knight clearly has, only has 30,700 hit points at tier 10. That's actually less base hit points than the German tier 10 destroyer, the Elbing, which is a destroyer. Although it's not a strictly fair comparison because the Elbing is known for having an extremely high hit point pool by destroyer standards, but still, this is a cruiser that has less hit points than a destroyer at the same tier. So she does not have a large amount of health. She also only has 32mm of side armour plating, which is good because it's exactly enough with very careful angling to be able to bounce 16 inch armour piercing shells, but without very careful angling, you're just asking to be citadeled, and you only have 30,000 hit points. 35,000 if you've taken the survivability expert skill. Unlike the Atlanta, the Austin does not get radar, but she does get very good torpedoes. These are effectively Fletcher torpedoes. She can launch five per side, but you don't really want to be building the Austin around her torpedoes. That's ignoring the main strength of the ship. Which Maltese Knight is about to demonstrate, because while these guns do have a kind of slow-ish reload at around eight seconds, she gets a very impressive main battery reload booster which basically turns this ship into a machine gun. That 8 second reload drops down to less than 2 seconds with this main battery reload booster. And if you've built this ship for reload the way Maltese Knight has, that 8 second reload is actually more like 6.5 seconds, and with the booster active that 2 second reload is actually more like 1 second. <laughs> And that's kind of what polarises Austin captains into either loving or hating the ship. Because it's not a bad ship without the main battery reload booster. You know, the speed is okay, but it's not particularly fast. It doesn't have a lot of health, and it does have terrible armour. Not having radar isn't a great selling point. It's one of the few American high-tier cruisers that doesn't get it. It does have higher-than-average range on its 5-inch guns, though, 15 kilometres. And unlike an Atlanta, if it had guns that could fire out to 15 kilometers, the ballistics are better on the Austin, firing its high explosive and semi-armor piercing, not armor piercing shells, which means that the shells will usually arrive at the target before the letter that you've written to the captain of the target does. But none of that really matters. Well, unless you're shooting at a destroyer, in which case 
The semi-armor piercing and the high explosive are going to do devastating amounts of damage, but what makes the Austin special, what makes it good, is that main battery reload booster. Probably the best main battery reload booster consumable in the game, for two reasons, one of which you've already seen. It doesn't just boost the reload of your guns by 50% for a short period of time, it boosts the reload by a couple of hundred percent for a short period of time. And unlike other main battery reload boosters, it doesn't come with charges. You get unlimited uses. Which means that every time you trigger it, for 15 seconds, you're basically firing 12 shots per second, and your damage output is measured in damage per second, not damage per minute. And when it's on cooldown, you only have to wait a minute and 45 seconds before you can use it again. As many times as you want. And it's this gimmick which, let's face it, the entire ship is basically built around, which is the source of polarization among the community of USS Austin captains. Because while it is undeniably a great ship while the booster is active, but while the booster is not active, or in other words, for a minute and 45 seconds out of every two minutes that you play, assuming you're using the booster on cooldown, it is not a great ship. It's not a bad ship, but there's absolutely nothing special about it. You basically have to play around that main battery reload booster cooldown. Oh, did I mention this was arms race? You've probably noticed some unusual icons, both on the map and at the top of the screen. Oh, hang on a second, Forrest Sherman, another ship with fearsome DACA and Maltese Knights booster is ready to go. Austin goes brrrr. <laughs> Yep, that's just what this ship does when that gimmick is ready to go. I mean, the Forrest Sherman is no slouch when it comes to firepower. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I showed a Forrest Sherman replay where a pair of them basically did that to an Austin. But when the shoe's on the other foot, the Austin, well, you just saw what he did. That Forrest Sherman went from full to dead in a matter of seconds. But like I said, this ship is not without its weaknesses. He opens up at the Zhao, which gets him spotted. The Zhao mostly misses, the Daring mostly misses, but that 16-inch armor-piercing salvo from the Vermont 17 kilometers away definitely does not. And suddenly he's down to less than half health. However, he does have a heal, and because this is arms race rather than standard battle or domination, or epicenter for that matter, I figure it's high time I explained what those unusual icons are, both on the minimap and at the top of the screen. See, in Arms Race, it mostly revolves around capturing areas that contain buffs. And the buffs that Maltese Knights team have at the moment are a heal, increased ship hit points, and reload reduction. Three buffs that, in particular, for the captain of an Austin, are very, very good. At the moment, his maximum hit points are up to 38,400. Although he's taken enough armor-piercing damage, particularly from that Vermont, that he's never going to be able to get all the way back up there. But there is a trickle of hit points coming in, even though his heal is now on cooldown, thanks to that heal buff that his team have picked up. And while in Arms Race there are no capture points as we recognize them from standard battle and domination battle, there is a capture point of sorts which is about to appear roughly in the center of the map. And there it is. Now this does work just like a capture point in other game modes, but with one key difference. It gets smaller as the battle goes on. Which usually means that in the last couple of minutes of the battle, assuming the battle lasts that long, if you don't want to lose to the enemy team taking that capture point, you're going to have to get way closer than you're probably going to be comfortable with. Oh, Maltese Knight's got the perfect opportunity to unload some hurt on the Goliath here. Unfortunately, he was going just that little bit too fast to take advantage of the smoke screen. He did get spotted, and rather than trying to reverse into it, he's simply motoring on out of there. These are basically destroyer tactics. Get into a gunfight, turn around, extend the range, and basically just use your rear turrets. And it completely obliterated the Goliath in the 15 seconds that that booster was active. The Goliath basically had the time to swing the turrets around and fire a single salvo with the front turrets. And that was all he got. He managed to score a hit, did a little bit of damage, knocked out one of the gun turrets, but Maltese Knight fixed that instantly by using the damage control. 
Arguably, he didn't need to. It's not like he's under attack now that the Goliath is dead. There's nobody spotting him. He now has shots at the Conqueror, but he's going to wait and hold his fire until the Conqueror is behind the island and can't see him when he shoots. And it was a good plan, and it would probably have worked if the Conqueror had been the only thing with line of sight. But he's probably being spotted by the Daring. You don't really want to get into a gunfight with the Daring, because it can do a lot of damage. At least, you don't want to get into a gunfight with the Daring until your main battery reload booster is available for use. So he's carefully manoeuvred to a position behind one island that's blocking the Daring's line of sight, but still allows him to lob shots over the intervening islands and mostly clear the terrain and continue to rain shots down on the Conqueror, who has been sunk. Now, I say you don't want to get involved in a gunfight with the Daring until you've got the main battery reload booster ready to go, and while that's certainly true, the Austin can almost certainly still take the Daring even without it, but you'll take a lot more damage in the process, and I'm pretty sure he's coming around this corner looking for the Daring, but he's run into the Zhao instead. This is going to be bad news for the Zhao. Because remember, he has 32mm of side plating, which is enough to deflect 16-inch armour piercing shells if you're properly angled. And even if the Zhao was to have the high explosive loaded, he's probably only going to get one shot before the semi-armour piercing shells do that to him with the booster active. So the Zhao has almost certainly launched torpedoes, and Maltese Knights is aware of that as I am. So he's manoeuvring to avoid them. Like I often say, you don't have to have Hydro, you don't even have to have Hydro running, which he doesn't, to know that a ship that has torpedoes and has just turned broadside onto you probably did it to get those torpedoes away. So manoeuvre accordingly. Fortunately, the Daring was elsewhere and was not able to join in. Unfortunately, the team have just lost their Petra Pavlovsk, who was doing a fantastic job denying that central and now much smaller cap circle from the enemy team. The Petro was able to hold on long enough, however, to not only scare the enemy Daring out of there with his radar, but also to buy some time for the team to move two ships of their own up into that rapidly diminishing cap circle. There's a Halland and the Jinan, however the hell you pronounce the name of it, the Tier 10 Pan-Asian light cruiser. Unfortunately, Maltese Knight's team have just lost their Yoshino, taken out by the enemy Napoli, down there to the southwest. That Napoli, however, is on extremely low health, as we'll see in a moment when Maltese Knight, there it is. Honestly, I'm surprised nobody's shooting at him. You would have thought that the Ohio and the ball going down to the south would be, because there's not a lot else they can do all the way down there. I mean, it's possible they are shooting at it, but they're certainly not hitting. And ironically, it's actually the Yoshino's torpedoes, which he launched before the Napoli killed him, that are going to hit and sink the Italian heavy cruiser, which means the Ohio and the Borgoyne all the way down to the south are going to have even less to do. Although potentially there's also an enemy Zhao over there somewhere as well. Now, back to the rapidly shrinking cap circle. Just because the Daring isn't contesting it does not mean that he is not spotting it. Although, obviously, with Maltese Knight's guns blazing away, everybody within 15 kilometers is going to be able to see him, and anybody within gun range is going to be able to shoot at him, which they are, of course, doing. What this does mean, however, is that everybody switches their fire to Maltese Knight, who has just arrived in the cap circle and doesn't have many capture points, and stops shooting at the Halland and the Jinan, who have been in the cap circle for a while and do have a lot of capture points. And while that may seem suicidal, and for a lot of players probably would be, if you were in a light cruiser in open water inviting a battleship and a Worcester to shoot at you, Maltese Knight was not sailing predictably and was varying his throttle to ensure that almost all of the shots fired at him missed. The enemy daring also did him a favour by not falling back and continuing to spot and instead smoking up outside the cap circle and blocking everybody's line of sight to him, and then getting spotted by Hydro in front of an Austin and a Halland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that was not the Daring's finest moment. At this point, they could win by capping. The Zhao's the only ship with direct line of sight. They're out of range, although they've lost the Halland. But they are out of range of the Worcester's radar. 
And if Maltese Knight would have just stopped shooting, you'd go and detect that the Zao would have to pull a right turn and chase him into the cap circle, which would expose his broadside to fire from the Bourgoyne and the Ohio to the south. But, eh, where's the fun in that? If they kill the Zao, there will be two ships and probably about 300 points up. Yeah, the Worcester's come out. He wants to maintain line of sight. I mean, it's light cruiser versus light cruiser, yeah? Well, it is and it isn't. They are technically both light cruisers. But there are light cruisers and then there are extremely light cruisers. The Worcester is armed with a lot of 6-inch guns. The Austin is armed with a lot of 5-inch guns. And without that reload booster active, the Worcester definitely has the firepower advantage. But Maltese Knight is actually manoeuvring in open water. He's varying the throttle. He's doing all the same tricks that he was pulling before. And the Worcester is basically just sailing around in a broad, lazy circle. Which means that the theoretical DPM advantage that the Worcester had was largely wasted because he was missing with most of his shots. And Maltese Knight was not. The Jinan, who I have to say has been a great teammate thus far, takes a brutal battering by the Vermont over there, but does manage to get his deep water torpedoes away. Unfortunately, the Worcester manages to finish him off, lobbing shots over the side of the island there. They've managed to momentarily lose sight of the Vermont, which seems improbable, but well, it's mostly because of its horrendous 40 second reload and it had been more than 20 seconds since it last fired. But it's back up again. Maltese Knight gets his torpedoes away. The reload booster is ready to go, but he's holding his fire until he can get in behind this island. It looks like the Vermont's captain is going to be able to find a sufficiently wide gap even for that ship's massive ass between the Jinan's torpedoes. But he swings the back end out just a little bit too much and clips one of them. Maltese Knight opens up. The Vermont returns fire. There goes the reload booster. The Vermont does score a hit, but it's mostly just over penetrations. However, he is spotting Maltese Knight, which allows the Worcester to get a target solution, so he inches forward to get the island between himself and the ship that's spotting him. And the Vermont now enjoys the opportunity of dying in the shade. <laughs> the amount of shells. Holy crap. He did set a fire. He pokes out, holds his fire. No need to shoot. Respots the Vermont. The Vermont is burning, the fire kills him, there's the Kraken unleashed, the fifth kill, that just leaves the Worcester. A 300 point and two kill lead. He could easily win by capping now. But where's the fun in that? <laughs> the Bulgoin is closing in to try to get the Worcester from the far side of the island. Maltese Knight is closing in to try to get the Worcester from the near side of the island. The Worcester launches his uh, depth charge attack planes, which probably means he's got no charges on his radar left, which is great news. It means he's going to have to come out and look, which is exactly what he does. Maltese Knight taking a shot there to see if the Worcester had fallen back, seeing if that was going to get him spotted. The Worcester has not. He's coming out to fight. He's loaded the armor piercing, knowing that he's just facing a light cruiser. But it's a light cruiser with 32 millimeters of armor belt which can bounce 16-inch armor-piercing shells and has absolutely no problem bouncing 6-inch armor-piercing shells. If Maltese Knight had armor-piercing shells, the Worcester would already be dead, broadsiding as it was when it came out from around the side of the island. While he does not want to turn to show his broadside in order to get torpedoes away, everybody always has at least one torpedo. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Of course, it's a torpedo that you usually only get to use the once, but once was enough. So, Maltese Knight in the USS Austin, a ship that is definitely not for everybody, but in the right hands, as you've just seen, is capable of, quite frankly, terrifying amounts of damage. 365,000 damage done in a tier 10 light cruiser. And there are a couple of notable things about this particular battle, because that is not only the EU damage record for the USS Austin, he also managed to earn more than 4,000 base experience. More than double the base experience earned of the next best player on his team, who also had a very good game, and is more than four times the amount of experience or base experience earned by most competent players on the winning team who have had a decent battle. That was a truly phenomenal performance. 
And if you like what you've seen and you want to see more, then please feel free to check out the link in the video description because Maltese Knight streams World of Warships regularly on YouTube. I hope you've enjoyed watching his performance today. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.